Alright everybody, uh, hello, we're back. It's time to do the introduction to the Open Society and its enemies. And uh, I, I went ahead and uploaded the first uh, George Soros forward um, video to YouTube and I'm happy to say a, a handful of my buddies have reached out to me. So uh, thanks to one of them, the ponytail is back by pop popular demand. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're, we're kind of getting the getting the wheels on this thing, you know, getting the ball rolling. Um, so without further ado, um, let, let's go ahead and, and just uh, kind of keep moving right along here. Um, th this is the introduction to the Open Society and its enemies, by the way. Um, and this was written by Alan Ryan. Um, so he says, Karl Popper was one of the most important philosophy philosophers of science in the 20th century. Um, and th that's very important. Um, you, you look at the values that Karl Popper brings to the table, you look at the values of the modern day Democratic Party, um, and, and you see these people talk about science. Um, Karl Popper was a philosopher of science. He was very interested in the distinction between science and pseudoscience. He's interested, philosophically speaking, in, in what we consider to be truth. Um, and, and I'm interested to see how the account of truth that I gave in an earlier video will stack up um, against what Karl Popper has to say on the subject. So th this is going to be fascinating. Uh, l let's keep moving right along though. Oh, actually, sorry, I, I need to silence my cell phone. <laughs> um, or my iPad, I guess. <laughs> Alright, so without further ado, um, Karl Popper was one of the most important philosophers of science of the 20th century, and among the most important philosophers of the century, Tocqueville. Um, unlike most philosophers of science, he was admired by practicing scientists, some of several of whom, uh, excuse me, getting all tongue-tied already, <laughs> that's not a good sign, is it? Um, se several of whom claimed that he had influenced their work. They included the Nobel Prize winners, Sir Peter Medawar and Sir John Eccles. Popper's influence was reflected in the fact that he enjoyed the rare distinction of being a fellow of both the Royal Society and the British Academy. Although the Open Society and its enemies is commonly thought of as a work of political theory, it is just as much a work in the philosophy of history and social science, and because Popper thought there were no important methodological differences between the social and natural sciences, it bears directly on Popper's philosophy of the natural sciences too. Um, so, so this connection is going to run all the way through, um, and, and everything ties together. Um, it, the, the more philosophy uh, we read together, the, the more we'll see that there is just this um, incredible web of connections that, that just permeates all of these works and just runs right through them and ties them all together. Although the Open Society's assault on Plato, Hegel, and Marx, its primary targets, rests on ideas formulated in Popper's philosophy of science, his political interests had underpinned the development of his philosophy of science in the first place. Popper wrote The Open Society and completed a companion essay on the philosophy of history, the poverty the poverty of historicism in New Zealand during the Second World War, but their roots lie in Viennese politics, and more specifically in the catastrophes that befell Austrian socialism. So Karl Popper is probably not going to be somebody who uh, modern politics is really going to gear us up to, uh, to understand, naturally speaking. Um, and the reason for that is that they want to call everybody a socialist and they want to talk about socialism as though it's, you know, this bad thing. Um, but, but in fact, um, a, a lot of that theory is, is stuff that is, is not going to be completely uh, what, what they would lead us to believe when they talk about it. They're, they're, they're more talking smack um, than they are uh, really being, you know, serious and, and honest about what they have to say. Um, Popper was born in Vienna on July 28, 1902, into a cult, highly cultivated upper middle class family. His father Simon was a lawyer and his mother Jenny Schiff an accomplished pianist. His family was Jewish by origin, but his parents converted to Lutheranism before he was born. 
This was not out of religious conviction or embarrassment at their Jewish antecedents. Simon Popper was, in his son's words, a radical liberal of the school of John Stuart Mill. His politics were secular and skeptical, but he believed that going along with one's community's religious practices was a form of politeness. Interesting. That, that's almost a nod to, to someone like Heidegger, right? Uh, Simon Popper was highly educated and widely read, possessing a library of some twelve to 14,000 volumes, and Popper's background was, as he wrote in his autobiography on Andy Quest, decidedly bookish. On his father's shelves were Plato, Aristotle, Kant, and the collected works of John Stuart Mill in the six-volume translation by Theodore Gompers. It was a musical household as well, with Bosendorfer grand piano in the drawing room, and Popper himself held interesting if unusual views about the history of music, including a marked preference for classicism over modernism. He sometimes said that Schubert was the last great composer, Wagner he loathed as much on the account of the ring cycle as for the of the text of the ring cycle as for the music, Richard Strauss was dismissed as pastiche. <laughs> so Popper was a man of taste. All right. The First World War broke out as Popper turned 12. Austria went to war with Serbia on his birthday. His sub he subsequently had a fragmentary, uh, fragmented secondary education, but not because of the war. He found the teaching at his real school dull and slow moving. And some of the teachers, or some of his teachers, obnoxiously anti-Semitic. He left the school at the age of 16 and began to attend classes at the University of Vienna in 1918, um, but did not matriculate to attend as a regular student until 1922, a couple of years later than he would have done if he had remained at school. However, it was 1919, the year after the ending of the war, that was one of the most significant of his life, both politically and intellectually. Several of his relatives were committed socialists, as were his closest friends. Many of them were Marxists, and for a short time, Popper himself succumbed to the charms of historical materialism. He also joined the student wing of the Austrian Social Democratic Party. He was alienated by the easy assumption of his middle class and highly educated friends that they were the natural leaders of the manual working class. He at least had tried, and failed, to work as a road mender. Nonetheless, he was a committed socialist. What he came to think of as a decisive refutation of Marxist theory of social and political change was an incident in the summer of 1919 when some young socialists tried to rescue a number of communists being held by the police. The demonstrators were unarmed, but the police opened fire and several of the demonstrators were killed. Popper was not a pacifist in the sense of thinking that a resort to violence was never justified. He had no doubt that Hitler could be stopped only by force. On this occasion, he concluded that although the police were brutal, the demonstrators were misled by Marx's views on the need to intensify the class struggle and were likely to get both themselves and those whose lives they hoped to improve killed to no purpose. Writing about these events years later, Popper was no doubt guilty of imposing the lessons of hindsight on his reaction, but he never renounced his view that the social democratic students and the Austrian workers' movement were morally, morally admirable, deeply and altruistically committed to building a better world. Indeed, he said, as late as 1976, that he would have remained a socialist all his life if he had thought that it was possible to reconcile socialist egalitarianism with freedom. So he thinks there is a problem between socialism and freedom, so, some sort of contradiction. I, I assume uh, that as we read the book, <laughs> we'll, we'll get a little bit deeper into what that might be. At the time, he was working at, with, as a volunteer with Adlerian psychologists to help neglected children. So before he turned 17, Popper had already been exposed to the two great redemptive theories of early 20th century, Marxism and psychoanalysis. He maintained that the encounter with Marxism made much, made, the much, uh, made much the more important impact on his thinking. But absent that provocation, he would have been quick to reach the conclusion that psychoanalysis, whether Freudian, whether Freudian or Adlerian, owed more to poetry and myth than to science, properly speaking. The, the event which 
in memory at least, propelled Popper toward the fundamental ideas of his philosophy of science was far removed from the street battles or the struggle to help distressed children. It was hearing Einstein lecture on the theory of relativity, dazed is how Popper would later describe his reaction, the theory of general relativity made surprising experimental predictions, which had been confirmed in May 1919. Had they not been confirmed, the theory would have been refuted, as Einstein himself insisted. The theory had not been proved true. Popper was already working towards his fallibilist view that theories can never be proved, although they can be decisively disproved. But it had sur survived a severe test and had emerged had emerged as a theory worth embracing. Sorry everybody, I'm getting some text messages uh, about COVID. I'm trying to keep the phone screen on so that it won't notify us on the uh, on the Mac here. Okay, um, his Adlerian and Marxist colleagues displayed none of Einstein's theoretical modesty and none of his readiness to abandon a much-loved theory in the face of a decisive refutation. So they liked the theory so much that they didn't want to get rid of it, even if it was disproved. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Um, okay. They were verificationists, pointing to evidence that was in line with their theoretical allegiances, while either ignoring evidence that contradicted their beliefs, or rewriting the theory to turn apparent contradictions into verifications. The most obvious example is the psychoanalytical concept of resistance which enables the analyst to claim either that the patient's acceptance of a diagnosis confirms it, or that the patient's rejection of the diagnosis demonstrate, oh, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> um, demonstrates resistance and therefore likewise confirms it. We cannot know how much of this was clear to Popper at the age of 17. If he had read as widely in his father's library as he appears to have done, he would have encountered Mill's claim in On Liberty that the strength of our conviction should be proportionate to the ability of our beliefs to withstand the severest criticism we can direct at them. Subsequently, at least, he thought Marxism was not so much non-science as bad science. Marx had made many predictions that had proven false. In his 60s, in responding to new work in the sociology and history of science, he dismissed much of social science as only dubiously scientific. At the University of Vienna, uh, sorry. Okay, um, at the University of Vienna, Popper studied mathematics and physics as well as philosophy. <laughs> Alright, so yeah, the Kindle Cloud Reader in the browser isn't, uh, isn't quite perfect. Um, also, I wish I could figure out how to snooze notifications on my text for the uh, desktop here. I will work on that in between this video and the next one. Um, okay. He later recalled that he had given no thought to how he would earn his living. <laughs> that sounds a lot like your boy here, doesn't it? Oh, man. That it's too funny. Uh, one track minds us philosophically minded people, huh? Um, but okay, since the economic situation made it impossible to plan a career. Oh, wow, that actually also sounds uh, pretty familiar. <laughs> I graduated college in 2008, so, uh, so sometimes they're better than others for, for the traditional uh, sort of path to life, I guess. Um, okay. Nonetheless, he was certified as an infant teacher in 1925, gained his Ph.D. in cognitive psychology in 1928, and qualified as a secondary school teacher in 1930. Like many upper-class families, the, popular, the Poppers had lost almost all their savings in the inflation at the end of the war. To avoid burdening the family, Popper took a variety of jobs both before and during his time at the University of Vienna, from, making, uh, from road making at one end of the spectrum to giving German lessons to American students at the other. Between 1922 and 1924, he was apprenticed to a cabinet maker. He was, however, already obsessed with the philosophy of science, and his carpentry suffered. 
He joked in his autobiography that it was only when he became a lecturer in philosophy in 1937 that he finally discovered how to work on a writing desk while thinking about epistemology. <laughs> Oh man, that's fantastic. So, so he had kind of a roundabout uh, path to, to becoming a, a professional teacher as well. Um, okay, so to, to secure unemployment, or to secure <laughs> employment as a secondary school teacher, he had to enroll at the newly founded Pedagogic Institute, although many of the courses were given at the University of Vienna. It meant giving up his work with neglected children, but he was enthusiastic about the prospects of school reform and an eager student. The course involved a lot of educational theory imported from America, such as John Dewey, <laughs> uh, we, we know him, all right, or Germany, Georg Kirstheimer, about which his experience with neglected children made him deeply skeptical. In fact, his casual remarks about education elsewhere in the unended quest come very close to denying that teaching is either possible or necessary. Once children have mastered reading and writing, they can take care of the learning process for themselves, albeit with the aid of the persons who are conventionally labeled teachers. Unended Quest is, in fact, generous to Kurt Bueller, his PhD supervisor, and to Heinrich Gompers, son of the great Theodore Gompers, and the key figure in his early philosophical development. Learning as distinct from teaching lay at the heart both of Popper's account of science and his defense of the open society. Science is a trial and error learning process, and one of the virtues of an open society is its ability to learn from experience. And it strikes me that Popper is philosophizing from experience here. Um, he's spent time with um, children, and he has uh, developed sort of his pedagogical theory that seems to be somewhat in line with Plato because he says teaching is impossible um, and Plato says some similar things um, in the Mino dialogue um, but, but also um, you know Popper is someone who learned this stuff through the school of hard knocks more so than he did through the traditional education system and he is someone who is devoutly literate um, which has influenced him to believe that reading and writing are the cornerstones of education and actual teaching is uh, not so much a thing. Um, so, so that's fascinating and, and that, that gives us a good deal of insight into, uh, into how Popper is going to present um, the problems that he approaches here. I, I would like to just take another brief second to note that also Karl Popper is not doing anything uh, that should be offensive to anyone. Um, so, so the fact that we are in a situation where um, one of his disciples is sort of the enemy of the right wing of politics, it probably has more to do with the fact that these people have an agenda um, than anything with respect to uh, Popper or anyone else as far as, uh, you know, like, like evil liberal schemes to, to be pedophiles or whatever. You know, they, they, these people are good people, and uh, the QAnon stuff, I mean, it, it's just off base. Um, so, alright, uh, moving back away from current day politics, uh, let's get back to the text. He says, uh, Closed societies resist novelty, and therefore pass up the chance to learn from experience. The years from 1925 to 1930 were happy in spite of the uncertain political and economic situation not least because it was at the Pedagogic Institute that he met Josephine, Josephina Henninger, also always known as Henny, whom he married in 1930 when they both took their first teaching post. Ah, oh, that's sweet. Um, the marriage produced no children, but it was a close, if not always a happy one. Henny found the move to New Zealand almost unbearable and did not much like London when she and Popper moved there in 1946, and seems to have been less frequent, uh, frequently depressed even when they moved out of London to Penn in Buckinghamshire. On the other hand, she was indispensable to Popper's career. She typed everything that he wrote, dealt with publishers, and was altogether more deft in dealing with, with other people than he was. Interesting. So, so they had sort of a partnership. She, she handled the, public, uh, the public end and he handled the uh, content creation. That, that's fascinating. Um, okay. Popper was not unhappy teaching science to secondary school students, but his passion was by now for philosophy, and more narrowly for the philosophy of science. How far 
Um, this was a natural outgrowth of his 1928 doctoral work on issues of methodology in cognitive psychology is debatable. His thesis was titled Zur Methodenfrage der Dingspsychology. <laughs> okay, um, the question of method in cognitive psychology. Almost immediately after passing his PhD examination, which involved examinations in philosophy and the history of music as well as psychology, he wrote a further dissertation on analytical geometry to teach mathematics and science in secondary school. Between 1929 and 1932, he wrote a typescript on epistemological issues that remained unpublished until 1979, but in 1934 he published Logic der Forschung, Forschung uh, okay, an incontestable masterpiece, and the moment with uh, when the essential popper, a phrase of the great enemy of essentialism would have hated, emerged. It was only with the assistance of the members of the Vienna Circle, in particular Herb Herbert Feigl, that pop uh, popper was able to publish logic, but the prestige of the series of monographs by members of the Vienna Circle in which it appeared secured a wide audience. Many years later, Popper grumbled that it had been reviewed more widely than its English translation, The Logic of Scientific Discovery, when it appeared in 1959. That's wild. Um, okay, so I hope everybody's still with us. Uh, let, let's go ahead and continue going here. He says uh, he was on friendly terms with several members of the Vienna Circle, the group of philosophers usually described as the logical positivists, but he was never invited to join. One reason was that he was regarded as arrogant, obsessive, and unamenable to argument. The near paranoia that poisoned working relationships in England after 1956 was visible long before. Doctrinally, he and the Vienna Circle were entirely at odds. The Vienna Circle embraced the so-called verification principle, the doctrine that the meaning of propositions and their constitutive terms lay in their method of verification. Popper espoused what became known as falsificationism, the doctrine that what we are interested in in the sciences is the conditions under which we should reject a proposed law or theory. The proposition that all swans are white is decisively refuted by one black swan, no matter how often it has been verified by sightings of white swans. The Vienna Circle's view of philosophical analysis was reductive. Pos uh, propositions about physical objects were reduced, or analyzed, into propositions about actual and possible scenarios. Popper was a common-sense realist about the physical world. Conversely, he thought there were no unchallengeable statements about observations and sensations. All observation is theory-laden, and we cannot but approach the world with preconceptions. The Vienna Circle was empiricist and phenomenalist, and Popper was a critical rationalist. Popper and the Vienna Circle were, at bottom, interested in very different issues. Both were a matter of demarcation, but whereas the Vienna Circle was interested in questions of meaning and looked for a principle to demarcate and nonsense, Popper was contemptuous of arguments about meaning, regarded a concern for definition as mostly mistaken, and sought to distinguish claims about the world that could plausibly feature in science from those that could not. The Vienna Circle's conviction that metaphysics was nonsense was very different from Popper's view. He held that many metaphysical propositions were not only meaningful but indispensable, but because they were not susceptible of refutation, they were not scientific. The proposition that every event has a cause is one such. Failure to find the cause of an event would not count as a disconfirmation, but only as evidence that we would have to look further to find it. Popper was not a faithful disciple of Kant, but Kant's insight into the regulative function of metaphysical ideas was one that he could use. The success of logic resulted in invitations to lecture in England in 1935. Popper took a year's unpaid leave from teaching, as did Henny, and they began to think about a permanent departure from Austria. Although the political scene was increasingly ugly, Popper was in no immediate danger. Unlike many of his philosophical contemporaries, he was not politically active during the 1920s and early 1930s. Uh, 
In retrospect, he said that he thought his Jewishness would prove a liability to the Social Democrats he supported, though it's not obvious that he was prominent enough, prominent enough for it to have had much effect. In any event, in July of 1927, he was present with Henny when the police opened fire on a crowd of mostly unarmed socialists and workers protesting the acquittal of some members of the Heimwehr, the Catholic Nationalist and Conservative Militia, as a socialist, a socialist and his child were killed. The event confirmed Popper's view that Austria was on a path that would lead to uh, uh, lead either to civil war or to a fascist di dictatorship. Tensions between socialists and their opponents indeed got steadily worse and were only exacerbated by the onset of the Great Depression at the end of the 1920s. In retrospect, it was easy to see that the socialists had made a critical, uh, crucial error in arming themselves sufficiently to frighten their enemies, though without seriously intending to fight. Their opponents were all too ready to fight and much better organized. By the time of the Nazi accession to power in Germany in 1933, the Austrian socialists were entirely on the defensive. In, the, in February 1934, the Austrian Chancellor, Engelbert Dolphus, a Christian fascist, launched a coup, a coup to suppress the socialist opposition and to bolster himself against the Austrian Nazis to his right. The socialist militias fought a disorganized battle in Vienna and elsewhere, and two days of fighting saw the end of the Austrian social uh, saw the end of Austrian social democracy. A botched attempt at a coup by the Austrian Nazis a few months later resulted in the assassination of Dolphus and his replacement as Chancellor by Kurt uh, Schuschnigg. Schuschnigg resisted German pressure to unite Austria with Germany in Hitler's Third Reich, but the Anschluss of March 1938 was inevitable. Schuschnigg spent the next seven years in jail and the rest of his life teaching in the United States. Popper left Vienna in 1937 when it became clear that anyone of Jewish origin or socialist political leanings had no future in Austria. He could have gone to England as F.A. von Hayek and Ernst uh, Gombrich had done, but instead he accepted the offer of a lectureship at Canterbury University College in Christchurch, New Zealand, freeing up a refugee lectureship in England for others in greater need. It is impossible to guess what he expected to find at the other end of the earth, in a country with 1.6 million human inhabitants and 30 million sheep, what he did find was a small, stuffy college which more closely resembled a teacher's training college or a vocational, vocationally oriented communi community college than the research university that is the universe, University of Christchurch today. Professors familiar with the injunction to publish your parish will be astonished to that Popper had to reassure the principal of the then Canterbury University College that any research he did would be done entirely in his own time and on his own resources. Popper was already on one of the world's most distinct. Uh, Popper was already one of the world's most distinguished philosophers of science, but the news had not yet penetrated to the antipodes. It would have made little impact if it had. Popper's contempt for the, his head of department was withering and his unwillingness to disguise it was imprudent, but it was not wholly unmerited. So Popper is uh, getting to be someone who is, uh, whose character we understand to some extent. He, he's someone who has strong views and is not likely to um, blindly follow authority. Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. That's kind of what you would expect from a guy like him, isn't it? Um, okay, so Popper found intellectual companionship among his colleagues in the sciences with the economist Colin Simkin and, eventual, and eventually with the future Nobel Prize winner John Eccles. His closest philosophical colleague was J.N. Findlay, the Hegel scholar, who was then teaching in Dunedin at the University of Otago. Popper was an excellent lecturer, warm, warmly remembering 60 years later, or warmly remembered 60 years later by his former students at Christchurch. His attention, however, was focused on events on the other side of the globe, and he was unsurprisingly frustrated at the difficulty of doing anything to assist 
other scholars to escape persecution. He gloomily estimated that he had at most helped 20 to escape from almost certain death at the hands of the Nazis, which <laughs> seems a harsh judgment on himself. I mean, he saved 20 people's lives, right? That's pretty good. Um, of his own relatives, it appears that 16 were murdered by the Nazis or died by their own hand. Once the war had grow, uh, broken out, his isolation was even greater. The Open Society and its companion work, The Poverty of Historicism, were his contribution to the war effort. It may seem surprising that anyone should think that it was his war work to write two substantial volumes, the first of which demolished almost everything that Plato thought, and almost everything from metaphysics to politics, and the second of which did the same for Hegel and Marx. The uh, range of topics that the Open Society tackles is so much wider than anything one could plausibly describe as the inter intellectual hinterland of Nazism and Stalinism that even a friendly reader might wonder at whom their work was aimed. Few Nazis were likely to be moved by Popper's assault on Plato, and devout communists were long practiced in dismissing, uh, dismissing excuse me, their bourgeois critics. As a presumable, uh, presumably liberal and democratic readership, how much would their political allegiances be improved by a better understanding of Heraclitus and other pre-Socratics? The full answer lies in the book that follows this introduction, but the short answer is simple. In 1936, Popper had given a talk to F.A. von Hayek's seminar at the London School of Economics on the poverty of historicism. It was an attack on the idea that the task of the social sciences is to emulate, emulate, emulate the success of astronomy by predicting the long-term future of society. Popper thought that Marxism in particular was both intellectually and politically disastrous because it painted a picture of the inevitable the inevitable triumph of the proletariat that misled everyone who believed it. In New Zealand, he began to expand upon the essay and found it turning into another book entirely. So setting it to one side, he wrote The Open Society and Its Enemies. The connection with his philosophy of science was not hard to see, but readers who saw The Open Society as primarily an attack on Nazism and Stalinism often paid no attention. Popper had no doubt that science, the process of making bold conjectures about the world, and subjecting them to experimental tests was deeply unnatural. The open society was, is not wholly comfortable. Its opposite, what Popper and his admirers usually refer to as tribal society, is uh, much more so. So tribal society is more comfortable than the open society. And why? Well, most likely because tribal society is all about reifying the norms that we're taught, and the open society is all about questioning those and trying to improve them. Uh, change is more difficult than uh, th than it is to, uh, to to leave everything as it was before, right? Um, okay, so he says, We accept our beliefs uncritically on the authority of tradition, or the say-so of priests and elders, and react with shock and surprise to contra... Oh, excuse me, a hiccup. Uh, to contradiction. This is not a failing of one or a few people or societies, most of us want our beliefs to not only be true, but generally accepted as true, and we are tempted to evade or ignore whatever evidence con contradicts them. Makes sense. Confirmation bias. Uh, the scientific community, which is Popper's model for openness, exists to prevent our doing so. We are to believe nothing to feed, or on the say-so of our boss, head of department, or whomever. So appeal to authority isn't a way for us to establish truth. Um, Plato, the target of the first volume of the Open Society, stands for all those who claim they have an unchallengeable insight into the nature of things. Popper's long-held anti-essentialism is targeted at Plato and Aristotle. The deeper Plato, uh, Popper dug into Plato, the more he found a dislike. Plato was the originator of totalitarian political thought, and all the more dangerous because he was an undeniably great philosopher. Popper thought that Aristotle was infinitely Plato's inferior. I disagree with Popper on that. Um, and, you know, I mean, you can feel free to disagree with Popper on that as well. We're, we're not going to allow that to detract from Popper's arguments, um, be, because there is a lot of gold um, to mine here. Uh, but I, I think we're doing both him and ourselves a service by being critical when we read this and feeling free to, uh, to disagree with things. Uh, 
after we take the time that's needed to understand what's going on for the author, right? So, so one of our critical reading tips um, is that we need to understand, right, understand everything that's being said to the greatest extent of our ability, but we still make up our own minds about it, right? We still decide um, what to take away from it. And, and I'll argue with them for you um, some as we go here. And uh, yeah, so that'll be all good. Um, right. But okay, so uh, the deeper Popper dug into Plato, the more he found a dislike. Plato was the originator of totalitarian political thought and all the more dangerous because he was... Oh, we just read this paragraph. Excuse me. Getting the Open Society published once he had finished writing it in 1943 was a nightmare. In Britain, the paper, uh, paper was rationed and the prospects of a substantial two-volume work were bleak. Popper tried to have it published in the United States, but after a long delay it was turned down. He thought, it was, he thought this was because his publisher's readers were shocked by the ferocity of the assault on Plato. Finally, right at the end of the war, his friends Hayek and Gombrich came to the rescue and the, public, uh, the book was published by Rutledge and Ken, uh, Keegan Paul. It was much praised, sold well, and established Popper's reputation with a wider public. It was also the last time Popper wrote on political philosophy, and with the serialization of the poverty of historicism in Hayek's journal Economica in 1944 and 1945, almost the last time he wrote about the philosophy of, so, of the social sciences. He was less pleased than irritated that his defense of the applicability of the familiar hypothetico-deductive model of explanation to history and the social sciences gave rise to an, enormous sub, uh, to an enormous subsequent literature. He was somewhat interested in economics, but in no other social science, nor in the philosophy of history. His abiding interest lay in probability, to which much of his subsequent work was devoted. Summarizing Popper's political ideas is not easy, not least because he had no great interest in the politics of Britain, where he spent the last 49 years of his life, and no desire to pronounce on issues of public policy. He had preoccupations, as anyone might, who lived through the Cold War, and under the threat of nuclear annihilation, he was deeply alarmed by the danger of nuclear war, unwaveringly hostile to the Social Un Soviet Union, so that's a bit of a break from the existentialist friends uh, that we have uh, in Camus and Beauvoir and Sartre who are going to work pretty hard to try to, try to rationalize anything, uh, the, anything bad that comes out of the social, uh, Soviet Union, uh, communist government, right? Um, okay, so the end of the Soviet Empire in Eastern Europe gave him the pleasure one would expect. It is clear enough from his own account that he was a committed socialist until his 30s and a pra uh, pragmatic social democrat in the immediately post-war years. Um, so he's more of a centrist, right? Uh, he, he says himself how much he liked the social egalitarianism of New Zealand, which he regarded as both a well-governed society and perhaps the easiest society in the world to govern well. He also found the uninhibited liberalism of the United States invigorating and was less alarmed by the phenomenon of McCarthyism than many critics of the country. The popper of the open society was a mildly left of center reformist of a kind familiar in the 1940s Britain. Non-Marxist, humanitarian, pragmatic, a defender of the welfare state, a believer, as he said, in piecemeal social engineering. The phrase was slightly unfortunate inasmuch as it led some critics to believe that popper would thought we should be governed by a scientific elite. Nothing could be further from the truth. The analogy Popper relied on was that between the behavior of a scientific community governed by the ideals of free inquiry and a well-ordered constitutional democracy. Sounds a lot like the current day United States. Um, openness was crucial. Yeah, so uh, maybe aside from the Republican Party. <laughs> because he believed adamantly in the logical distinctness of facts and values, he had no doubt that the role of experts, such as it was, was to tell us how to achieve what we had a mind to. It was up to us to decide what it was we wanted to achieve. We could do anything we wanted, huh? Cool. 
Anything more was the kind of concession to the pretensions of philosopher kings that he would not tolerate. So that's a strong break from uh, the view that Socrates gives us in uh, Plato's book, The Republic, right? With the passage of time, he became more conservative in much the, the way that his contemporaries such as Isaiah Berlin did. This was not a principled conservatism, nor the attachment to free market capitalism of the disciples of Hayek, but the recognition that social reform was harder work than it, seemed, than it had seemed in the aftermath of World War II, and that the modest egalitarianism of the European welfare state was perhaps as much as he could reasonably be hoped for. Uh, so he's something of a pessimist now. Interesting. Like many of, uh, excuse me, like many others of his generation, he came to suspect that sustaining a lively and innovative economic system might place more constraints on the pursuit of equality than he had once thought. Again, he was, like Isaiah Berlin, a Cold War liberal whose antipathy to totalitarianism made him more friends to the political right than to his political left. That's strange. I mean, you think about George Soros being a contemporary of um, Karl Popper during his later years and a uh, student during his earlier years, and then you think about what's happened in terms of everybody trying to paint George Soros as some sort of leftist monster who's funding a bunch of terrorism and other bullshit like that that's just absolutely not true. Um, and, and you think, wow, this guy was a centrist in the 1940s? I mean, it, it's amazing. These days, uh, these views qualify you as, as being far to the left in the United States, or at least according to the conservative um, form of the political spectrum. That, that does, anyway. Okay. Um, he was frequently mistaken for a principled neoconservative of a Hayekian ideal, <laughs> wow, um, in part because he was a founding member of the Mont Perlin Society that Hayek took the lead in setting up in 1947. Many of its members were devout free market economists, including Ludwig von Mises himself. However, the guiding principles of the society, as distinct from what its members gravitated towards over the next 50 years, were reformist rather than purist. Hayek himself deplored Popper's lack of interest in economics. Some of those who have written about Popper's social and political ideas have thought that he should have been more of a classical liberal, which is to say a Hayekian, than he was. Whatever he should have been, he was, a, in political matters, much more of a pragmatist than that. The only absolute was substantially negative. Anti-totalitarianism and its positive face, the protection of an open society. Um, and, and that's an ideal that, that yeah, I mean, it, it gets uh, wrapped for being like such a leftist thing these days. Um, but back then he was considered a, a something of a right-wing guy, a centrist at the, at the best. Um, it just goes to show how much the political dynamics that animate our world can change. Um, another example of that, that that strikes me is the Southern Baptist Convention. They, they were extremely anti-abort... Uh, they, they were against abortion being illegal, and then it became illegal with Roe v. Wade in, I believe, 1957, and, uh, and immediately the Southern Baptist Convention began to oppose uh, the legal status of abortion. So, so these people were seeing coat hanger abortions, and they said, that's bad. Let's make it legal to get a doctor to give someone an abortion. And then they changed their minds again and said, okay, let's actually make it illegal to get an abortion from a doctor and just try to get rid of the, the, the idea itself, um, which, you know, obviously uh, they, they don't have control over everybody, so they can't just make people not have sex. Um, and, the, and the most likely thing that they'll be able to end up accomplishing, um, if they do make it illegal again, is... Uh, is another pivot to immediately, you know, getting to the point where they, they want to make it um, legal. <laughs> so so there, there's some issues there. And, and you, you get a lot of absolute truth um, in the abortion debate. People, people want to say, oh, it's absolutely wrong or it's absolutely right, and they don't want to look at the consequences, and it's all this idealism. And, and Popper would just, Popper would have a huge problem with that, let's just say. Um, so the right wing has moved more to the right. Um, the left is probably about the same if it hasn't also moved to the right. 
and the center has moved to the right as well. So, so politics is less liberal these days, at least for those of us here in the United States, um, than it was back then. Okay, so moving right along here, um, we're, we're almost to the end of this section, I believe. He says, uh, Popper was an opponent of the politici politicization of science represented, um, for instance, by the Soviet geneticist Trofim Lysenko, whose ability to silence his critics owed everything to Stalin's support and nothing to science. Um, <laughs> all right, so he was kind of state-sponsored, all right. Um, but Popper understood very well that ensuring that science can be driven only by its own intellectual standards is itself a political as well as a cultural achievement. That illuminates two things of some interest. The first is that Popper was an early proponent of the thought that a liberal society has no duty to tolerate the intolerant. It is not an uncommon view. Many writers whose liberalism is built on a theory of rights uh, think that any claim of a right implies a willingness to extend that right to others. Right, that's what a right is. Um, anyone demanding toleration for the free expression of their views must allow the same toleration to the expression expression of views with which they disagree. Conversely, the intolerant cannot expect toleration. For all its obvious good sense, this, this is a dangerous doctrine. Radical students campaigning on the basis of no platform for racists have, in the United Kingdom, frequently silent speakers at public events, usually to the benefit of the speaker's cause rather, rather than to their own. The view that only immediate self-defense or the need to prevent a breach of the peace are grounds for silencing someone allows the obnoxious more opportunity to offend their hearers, but it may prove a policy less liable to abuse. Popper's position was not grounded in any elaborate theory of rights, but in his sense that the enemies of liberal democracy had taken advantage of its freedoms to undermine it in the 20s and 30s. This was not an uncommon reaction among his contemporaries. Not an uncommon reaction today either. Um, and frankly, I, I, I've seen quite a few different unpackings of this argument, um, some in memes and some in essays, and, and it's a fascinating thing. So, so definitely uh, ha have a look at, uh, it may, maybe the thing to Google would be something like uh, uh, let's see yeah, the paradox of tolerance and, and it's right here on Wikipedia um, so, so that's a thing you can have a look at if you want to, uh, just to kind of get a, a feel for what's going on here before we actually uh, really get into it. Um, but okay, so a second interesting aspect of Popper's views on openness is his response to positions in the history and philosophy of science that challenged his own emphasis on conjecture and refutation. The main example was his reaction to Thomas Kuhn's little book, The Structure of Scientific Revolution. Popper was more measured than some of his then epigon, but like them, he deplored what appeared to be Kuhn's concessions to assorted forms of epistemo epistemological relativism. Kuhn argued that for long periods, science is governed by a dominant paradigm, an overarching set of beliefs about the world, about what constitutes good science, and about how to practice it. During these periods, there is little or no debate about deep issues as scientists practice what Kuhn calls normal science. Popper denied Kuhn's account of the history of science, but added for good measure that the apparent relativism of Kuhn's position was a threat to civilization. Popper's philosophy of science was not politically innocent, but its practical implications beyond the preservation of free speech, the rule of law, and some form of constitutional democracy are few. Social policy is eminently a matter of conjecture and refutation, piecemeal social engineering. George Soros' Open Society Institute, founding, founded in 1993, but building on the Soros Foundation created a decade earlier, was aptly named, and not only because Soros had been a student of Popper. Its commitment to the rule of law, democratic governance, social reform, and a thriving civil society leaves a great deal of room for the kind of experiments in healthcare, education, and other forms of social provision that mark the post-war welfare states. With his appointment to the London School of Economics in 1946, followed by his promotion to Professor of Logic and Scientific Method in 1949, Popper was secure at the center of post-war philosophical discussion. He remained in the London School of Economics until he retired in 1969. 
Although secure, he was not entirely happy. His eminence did not satisfy his craving for rec recognition, nor did his emphasis on the way he can, uh, individual, in, intellectual, excuse me, <laughs> on the way intellectual progress proceeds by constant criticism, make him any more willing to accept criticism of his own views. One by one, his disciples found themselves repudiated, only half in jest, students at the London School of Economics renamed his great book, The Open Society, by one of its enemies. Popper had some grounds for thinking that he received less than his due. He was never offered a chair at Oxford or Cambridge, for instance. On the other hand, he was a very difficult colleague, and after he moved to Penn, he became something of a recluse. Matters were not helped by his phobic reaction to tobacco smoke, which made it a nightmare for him, uh, for anyone who invited him to lecture to find a space where he could do so. He was certainly a great man, public honors such as his in 1965 knighthood and his appointment to as companion of honor in 1982 acknowledged the fact. But he was not easy. It is not hard to wonder whether he ever felt completely at home in Britain at all events when he died in 1994. It was in Vienna that his ashes were buried. Fascinating. So, so we get sort of um, sort of an interesting little introduction um, here. And, and I believe the idea is that Popper is something of a centrist and that we are um, not about to read something uh, by a Marxist, which um, makes this, I believe, the first video that I've done that was um, based upon a book that was not written by a Marxist. Um, so so this will be interesting, and, and I, I think Popper is a phenomenal thinker, um, very, very powerful, um, even if he was a, a bit tough to get along with. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so we're, we're very, very close to being done with um, the introduction video. If you're watching at home on YouTube, um, please feel free to, uh, to like, comment, and subscribe to just you know keep following along with us. Um, if you're watching here on Twitch, I'm going to go ahead and end this video and take another short break to...